Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, a scandal made in Japan. Kobe Steel, Japan's third largest steelmaker, admits that it faked data on parts used in cars, planes and bullet trains. General Motors, Boeing and Toyota are among the firms checking their products. Also this week, bubble trouble, why the International Monetary Fund and the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics are signalling danger ahead for the global economy. And the Trevi Fountain, sponsored by luxury fashion brand Fendi. Why, without private investment, many of Italy's most important monuments risk decay. Planes, trains, automobiles and fake components. Japan's Kobe Steel says that it was faking data about the strength of products delivered to more than 200 companies for the past decade. It's a scandal that's unsettling the transportation industry worldwide. General Motors, Boeing, Toyota, Honda, they all now have to check their supply chains. The manufacturer of Japan's Shinkansen bullet trains says that it's already found parts supplied by Kobe that failed to meet industry standards. The 112-year-old metals manufacturer said that further cases could come to light. Florence Louis reports from Tokyo. Made in Japan, and now these brands share one more thing in common. They're customers of Kobe Steel. The company has admitted employees fabricated data about product quality to meet customer specifications. The government says it's following the case closely. Although this was an agreement between private entities, we think that Kobe Steel's misconduct was something that has shaken the foundation of fair business transactions. The ministry is taking the situation very seriously. Kobe Steel says 200 customers in Japan and worldwide, including manufacturers of trains and planes, have received falsely certified materials. Customers are checking whether they used substandard products and whether there are safety issues or not. And yet, more revelations mean the scandal could be wider than initially thought. Kobe Steel admits that the fabricated data affected not only copper and aluminium products, but also iron powder, which is mainly used in making automobile components. Kobe also admits that it's launched an investigation into a subsidiary company, which is reported to have shipped material used for making semiconductors to customers without inspecting them. The Kobe scandal is the latest to hit corporate Japan. Faulty airbags made by Takata prompted the largest safety recall in history of the auto industry in June. The Japanese company has filed for bankruptcy. Nissan recalled 1.2 million vehicles last week after admitting unqualified staff carried out factory inspections. The scandals are seen by many as a further blow to Japan's reputation for quality manufacturing. That reputation has allowed Japanese companies to charge higher prices compared to cheaper competitors such as China. Not all analysts think the scandal is a disaster for Japanese brands. Japan tends to have a lot of overspec, right? Um, you know, they really, if you want to have the last 3% of perfection, you have to go to a Japanese company because they're the only ones doing that. While everybody else, you know, whether it's Korea, whether it's Germany, whether it's India, you know, operates on a minimum viable standard. Kobe Steel said the misconduct involved dozens of employees in as many as four factories and possibly going back 10 years. The full financial impact is still not known, but it could be huge if customers request replacements. The company's share price has already taken a beating on the stock market. Joining us now from Singapore, Marcel Tilliant. Marcel is a senior Japan economist at Capital Economics. Good to have you with us, uh, Marcel. So what now for Kobe Steel? Is this likely to be the end of the company? Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be the end. Um, there, there have been companies that have survived such corporate scandals. For example, uh, Nissan and Mitsubishi are, are still around, but other companies have indeed uh, gone bankrupt. For example, Takata, the, the airbag maker, has gone bankrupt after such a, a scandal. So, so it's, it's certainly a, a grave uh, threat to the company's future. Its reputation has been severely uh, dented. I mean, is it likely that we could perhaps see it, if, if not, if it doesn't go bankrupt, if it, it broken up perhaps? Um, I guess it, it could rebound if it, if it addresses the problems in a, in a comprehensive manner, uh, if it uh, proves that these things ha will be rectified and that, that they don't cause severe damage to actual uh, consumers. 
which was uh, the problem at Takata. So there is a chance that they, they will recover from this. It is the latest, though, in um, a number of corporate scandals in Japan. You alluded to, to some of them in your, your first answer. Uh, why is that? What is it about Japan and cutting corners? Well, I think a lot of these companies, they've been around for a very long time and they're facing uh, heavy competition from, from uh, China, from, from other countries. And um, I think it's also the corporate culture. I mean, comp employees at, at Japanese firms, they, they work uh, usually, usually for a very long t time at, at the firm. They get uh, seniority wages, so they, they, they don't want to lose their job. So basically, uh, they have an incentive to cover up if, if there's any problem. And they often work very long hours. So, so sometimes they might just uh, do things to please their managers that, that uh, isn't in the best interest of the company in the long run. They've also been, uh, there's also been a lack of corporate governance uh, in, 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 in recent years. I mean, it's been addressed now. We've, we're, we're starting to get uh, tougher rules from the Tokyo Stock Exchange. But of course, uh, changing the corporate culture takes longer than just uh, imposing some rules and, and fulfilling them on paper. This has done enormous damage yet again to Japan's reputation. You talk about those, those changes in the corporate culture. Do you think that the embarrassment of, of, of this latest scandal is going to help to speed up that reform process? Well, I think it will. I mean, the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange calculates... Uh, it has a corporate governance code, and we've seen some progress. So about a quarter of, of firms now fully meet the requirements. And the other three quarters will probably uh, continue to make efforts to meet those requirements. Also, I think if a foreign sh shareholders uh, will put additional pressure on management. Now, about 30% of, of stocks in Japan are owned by foreigners, and a lot of them are, are fairly big investors which put pressure on, uh, man on, on management to really reform and change their ways. You talked about some of the reasons for this, this, this corporate culture in uh, Japan. Could another be that, it, that it's still paying the price for the, for the dramatic cost-cutting that went on in Japan when the economy declined as it did in, in the 1990s? I think that's quite possible. I mean, it's, it's obviously... Uh, f firms that that facing rough competition, they have an incentive to cut corners, and um, being being lax on security standards is is one way to do so. So I think it's possible that it's still a reflection of of these uh, terrible times that lots of companies went through. Marcel, really good to talk to you on counting the cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. All right, still to come on counting the cost. Here's a riddle for you. What a big. German powerful are being kept hidden from prying eyes like mine and are causing no end of problems for Russia. Well, I'm Rory Challens and I'm on the hunt for them here in Crimea. Find out more later in the programme. Now, at the turn of the century, the dot-com bubble burst. Then, in 2008, the collapse of a bubble in U.S. house prices triggered the global financial crisis. Fast forward to 2017, Richard Thaler, the father of behavioral economics, is handed the Nobel Prize in economics, just as world stock markets hit new record highs. Thaler's work is all about how humans make irrational money choices. You may even remember him from the Hollywood movie The Big Short. In post-prize announcement interviews, he said that he's worried about the fact that nothing is spooking stock markets. They just keep crawling higher. Well, the International Monetary Fund has spent the last decade trying to pick up the pieces after failing to predict the last financial crisis. This week, the IMF said that nearly 75% of the world is now experiencing an upswing. It's predicting that the world's economy will expand by 3.6% in 2017 and by 3.7% in 2018. That's slightly higher than what it was predicting back in July. But the IMF also issued a warning. It said record low borrowing costs designed to help the economic recovery are pushing up debt levels in the world's largest economies. And it singled out China as one of the worst offenders. Well, the IMF and the World Bank are hosting a meeting in Washington, D.C., where finance ministers and central bankers from around the world are gathered. Shihab Ratanzi reports. The World Bank president says governments around the world need to spend. All countries need to invest more in their people. 
It's been a rough few decades for the World Bank and the IMF's reputations. Most recently, they failed to see the economic crash of 2008 coming, despite the millions of dollars they spend to monitor the world economy for just such crashes. And since 2008, as the sort of austerity programs long imposed on developing nations have been forced on developed countries like Greece, awareness and discontent with the IMF has grown. Finally last year, things seemed to change. The IMF published an analysis that admitted its neoliberal policies caused economic damage. And this week, the fund declared increasing taxes on the wealthy would not impede economic growth and would help address inequality. The result is growing political tensions in many places and increased skepticism about the benefits of globalization. But for the leaders of the 133 global groups protesting outside the meetings, the policies haven't changed overall with the rhetoric. For example, raising taxes on the rich. Neoliberalism says any monies raised by the government should then be given to private corporations. The Fight Inequality Alliance says any concern expressed about increasing inequality doesn't match the current policies of the World Bank and the IMF, such as their pushing of drastic cuts in Mongolia, Tunisia and Zambia, and leading the privatization of primary schools in Liberia, and funding investments and in projects in Honduras on land violently seized from peasants. The IMF failed to respond to our request for an interview. One of the social indicators that the IMF and World Bank often take comfort in is the huge reduction in global extreme poverty over the last few decades. Surely they argue proof that their brand of neoliberal globalization is working. However, a new report from the Center for Economic and Policy Research released this week found that two-thirds of the net reduction in extreme poverty in the world since 1990 was in China, which rejected that neoliberal economic model. The rebound in the 21st century was partly due to the fact that the IMF lost almost all of its influence in middle-income countries. For skeptics, both the IMF and the World Bank have yet to prove that their stated wish to eradicate poverty is anything more than a public relations strategy to conceal the same old economic approach. Joining us now from London is David Coker. David is a lecturer of finance at the University of Westminster in London. Good to have you with us again, David. So you've got the world's brightest and best financial minds meeting this week in, in Washington, D.C. at the World Bank and IMF meetings. They don't exactly have the greatest record, though, when it comes to predicting trouble ahead, do they? Uh, no, sir, they don't. And particularly we see their forecasts, their GDP forecasts, are very volatile when there's political instability. So the World Bank, the IMF, a reputation severely um, dented after failing to predict the economic crisis, the last economic crisis in 2007, 2008. Are they smart enough? Are we smart enough? Are governments, our institutions smart enough to avoid another catastrophe like that? The systems are very complex. I think, I think we understand the mechanisms and we've got a good feeling of what has to be done. I'm not convinced the political will is there. So even though some of the best minds at the IMF and the World Bank write excellent papers that talk about the solutions, we just don't have the political will to implement them. Uh, they're calling for uh, a larger or higher taxes, I should say, on the upper, way, upper, uh, upper wealth echelons. So we've got the 1% and more importantly, the one-tenth of 1% who saw in the wake of the financial crisis, saw their wealth soar. And yet we also know at the same time, uh, people in the lower 99% saw their wealth stagnate and in far too many cases decline. So I think we've got to align our political leadership with the IMF and the World Bank, start to open up, and we do have to take some choices which many of the elites may find unpalatable. Taxes do have to go up. We have to engage in a period of progressive policies that will help open up education for more people. If we can start to do this, if we can start to get control of the political environment, and in particular the instability that's bubbling underneath the surface, I think when the finan next financial crisis comes, because it's only a matter of time, we'll be in a much stronger position. If it were to hit tomorrow, I would suspect we'd see open revolution in some of the Western democracies. Uh, some of them are very, very unstable at this point. It's bubbling beneath the surface. So our leaders have to take the difficult decisions to do what's necessary to calm people down, to give people uh, the perspective, or the view, I should say, that there, there is opportunity for everyone in spite of the changes we're going through, not only politically, but technologically, which is also something uh, they're considering this week, these massive changes that are coming due to technological 
uh, innovation. Yeah, I mean, the World Bank, um, one of the things that is warning about is, is the risk that, that automation poses to, to all of us who, who work for a living. I mean, they're looking sort of 20 years, 30 years down the line. Are they, are they right to be doing that and, and warning about something which is so far in the future, given all the problems that, that, that exist in the world today right now? Well, there are a lot of problems now, but, but we, have to we have to face the fact that this fourth wave, as we call it, the digital revolution, it's not coming, it's here. And a lot of people have overlooked, uh, banking, for instance, my area, we're starting to see bots take over a lot of traditional jobs. We feel that a lot of banking jobs, are gonna, maybe as many as 30% of banking jobs will be wiped out. That's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when we start to see these upper skilled jobs wiped out, just decimated, uh, what will it do to lower skill jobs? People that, for instance, and I don't mean this to sound horrible, but people that uh, uh, deal with customers. We can program a bot that can do many of the queries. And a lot of companies, in fact, are playing with that. They're experimenting with these things. If you take a look at what Tencent in China is up to, Tencent in China pioneered these AI bots, and they've got a user base of some 700 million people who are quite happily using bots to plan holidays, to schedule uh, uh, dinner reservations, to book a car, to uh, plan anniversary trips, things like that. A lot of these jobs that are done by people right now, they're going to be wiped out. So the, the revolution's upon us. Again, it's up to our leaders to listen to what the World Bank and even to take a look at what's going on in banking and other areas and, and start to address these, the underlying, or probably start to address the changes and try to figure out what we're going to do with people. Unfortunately, I do feel a lot of our leadership is sleepwalking. They're letting the changes roll on. And again, we're going to see massive spikes in unemployment, not this time in the agricultural sector or the manufacturing sector, which, what, 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 which were impacted by the earlier waves of automation. Now it's going to be it's squarely in this digital sector of the economy. It's going to be squarely in the middle class services and upper middle class services. And it is something to worry about, and it will give rise, if there's another financial crisis and if these job um, cuts come, it will give rise to political instability we probably haven't seen since the 30s. David, um, I think it's really good to talk to you, <laughs> given, given the rather pessimistic nature of, of what we've been discussing. But many thanks indeed for being with us. Great to have you on Counting the Cost. Thanks for your time, Adrian. Take care. Now, German engineering giant Siemens, a Russian state-owned enterprise, and the case of the Crimean turbines. These are the main elements of a legal dispute which will be going to court in Russia next week, and it's all about EU sanctions. Rory Challens reports. What we're looking for in this disputed land is high-tech equipment, proof in finely machined steel of the lengths Russia's leaders will go to to supply the Crimean Peninsula with electricity and the trouble that's bringing to the Kremlin. Uh, the territory cannot do without uh, power lines. But Ukraine refuses to provide it, Russia's mainland doesn't have enough of it, and EU sanctions shut Crimea off from Western energy technology. So Russia's opted for deception. When they thought about building a power station on the mainland and to, trans to transfer electricity to the peninsula, uh, it was a fake because, well, it was just to attract those turbines from Siemens and to say, well, we'll install them here, but not on the occupied territory of the Crimea. But Crimea is where Siemens acknowledges the four turbines now are. The Reuters news organization filmed these two large objects in July at the Crimean port of Feodosia. Despite Russian media reports two years ago about the turbine's secret destination, Siemens accepted Moscow's reassurances that they were for southern Russia. But now the scandals force the German industrial giant to act. It's pursuing criminal charges, it wants its missing technology back, and it says it's scaling down Russian operations. They told us Siemens will halt power generation equipment deliveries from existing contracts to state-controlled customers in Russia for the time being. The EU has also responded with new sanctions, asset freezes and travel bans. When we visited Feodosia, the turbines, if that's what they were, had disappeared. Perhaps they're already here, one of the two new power plants being built in Crimea. But Russian technicians are expected to face significant problems getting them to work because Siemens is refusing technical assistance.
This whole Siemens gas turbine saga illustrates in a nutshell the bind that Russia has got itself into. In trying to wriggle past the EU's restrictive measures, Moscow has just incurred more of them. And with Washington signing in new American sanctions, the ability of Russia to secure the investment and technology it needs to stop the country sliding backwards, well, that only gets harder. Now to a power generation problem of a different kind, blacked out and on the brink of bankruptcy. Most of Puerto Rico still has no power. Nearly a month after Hurricane Maria devastated the US territory, it's just one factor crippling economic activity and adding to the humanitarian crisis unfolding there. The island is virtually bankrupt. It owes $70 billion in debt, and that makes recovery from a natural disaster of this scale incredibly difficult. Puerto Ricans with solar panels are among the few with a stable electricity supply. This week, though, Elon Musk, the CEO of electric car maker Tesla, offered to revamp Puerto Rico's power grid using solar technology. His offer was welcomed by Puerto Rico's government. It's feared that hundreds of thousands of people may leave if electricity is not restored soon. Budget airline Ryanair says that it'll challenge a Lufthansa Air Berlin deal. Lufthansa has agreed to buy more than half of Air Berlin, the failed German carrier, for $248 million. And rival Ryanair is not happy. It's accused Lufthansa of breaking EU competition laws and says the deal will result in higher prices for consumers. Ryanair may face some court time itself, though, as Belgium says it's going to sue the airline. Authorities there accuse it of not providing enough information to non-English speakers after it cancelled thousands of flights last month. And finally this week, some of the biggest names in Italian fashion are helping to restore ancient Roman monuments to their former glory. The government's turning to private businesses to help to pay for the huge cost of renovating sites like the Colosseum. Now, after four years, new areas of the building have been open to the public, and Neve Barker has been to take a look. It's a steep climb to the top of the Colosseum, commissioned by the Emperor Vespasian in the year 72. For the past 40 years, the fourth and fifth levels have been locked away from view. Until now. Welcome to the ancient cheap seats that probably wouldn't have offered the best view of the regular bloodbath down below, but they do offer a sensational view of the city. The opening of the upper levels is the result of a four-year epic restoration project. The outside's also been strengthened and spray cleaned to remove generations of grime. The cost, a colossal $30 million, and there's still more work to do. The sheer scale of Rome's archaeological heritage poses a huge financial burden for the city and for the country. The vast costs involved frequently exceed state budgets. Ticket sales help, but revenues don't go far enough. That's where high-end Italian fashion comes to the rescue. The Colosseum's renovation was largely paid for by the billionaire owner of Todd's luxury footwear company. It follows a $3 million renovation of one of Rome's main tourist attractions, the Trevi Fountain, paid for by clothes company Fendi. And the Spanish Steps, restored last year with more than a million dollars from jewellery designer Bulgari. When we had to celebrate our 130th anniversary, we wanted to create something really special for this anniversary. And that's why we thought to pay tribute to the city that welcomed our our founder and that also created so much richness in our creativity. The financial helps largely welcomed by Italy's cash-strapped government. But there are some concerns about big Italian companies using the renovations as a branding exercise. There's a real risk of commercialising ancient monuments, but the brands we chose last year were chosen carefully. We haven't seen any signs of companies abusing their patronage. Italians are intensely proud of their rich cultural heritage, but preserving it comes at a huge cost that, for now, only Italy's big businesses are able to cover. And that is our show for this week. If you want to comment on anything that you've seen, tweet me. I'm at A Finnegan on Twitter. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or you can drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. As always, there's plenty more for you online 
at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page, and there you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. In Doha, I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.